Hello, I'm Hazem Seeker. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Coronavirus is forcing the world to take unified action against health emergencies. But are rich countries ready to foot the bill for a global treaty on pandemic readiness? Also this week, they are super fast and unstoppable. Hypersonic missiles are driving a new arms race between the superpowers, and defense giants are eyeing the profits. Driven by the sun, Sono Motors raises millions to get its solar-powered cars on the road. We talked to one of the company's co-founders. The money spent by one person a week to buy a chocolate bar could help stop the spread of coronavirus and stave off huge economic losses. That's according to Save the Children. Now, the aid agency says every dollar invested in the global vaccination drive, rich nations could avoid losing $35 from their budgets. Yet wealthy nations have failed to provide the poorer countries with the much-needed vaccines. And there's been a lack of coordination to tackle the pandemic. That need to cooperate is now gaining momentum after the Omicron variant of COVID-19 was detected in South Africa. The variant threatens to reverse economic recovery and affect government's plans to deal with high inflation and supply chain backlogs. The World Health Organization member states have agreed to negotiate a global treaty on pandemic preparedness. But it would take years for the treaty to be put in place. The agreement is not expected to be signed before 2024, potentially after this pandemic has ended. And it aims to set up a global structure that would identify threats earlier and better share information on emerging viruses. Now, some countries have pushed for a sharp increase in domestic funding for healthcare systems. They've suggested an international financing mechanism worth 75 billion US dollars over five years. Among other ideas, boosting financial contributions to the WHO while calling for changes to its governance. And one of the most crucial elements of the plan, equal access to health goods, meeting demand for vaccines and other drugs and eliminating choke points in the system. Well, drug makers have opposed sharing the recipes of coronavirus vaccines with poor nations and the push at the World Trade Organization to waive intellectual property rights of the doses have so far failed. Now, South Africa is one of those leading the push for waivers at the WTO. After alerting the world about the Omicron variant, it now feels punished after several countries imposed travel bans on southern African nations. President Cyril Ramaphosa says the measures are hurting their economies. They basically say we will not allow you to travel around. But lo and behold, Omicron is spreading all over the world, including in their own countries. And now you ask yourself, where is science? They've always said to us, base your decisions on science, but when the moment comes for them to be more scientific, they are not. They resort to their own self-interest and ban travel from the Southern African countries. Well, I'm joined now from Johannesburg by Dr. Lumkele Monde, who is a professor at the School of Economics and Finance with the University of Witwatersrand. He's also a former chief economist and executive vice president at the South Africa Industrial Development Corporation. Good to have you with us, doctor. Now, we've talked about how um, South Africa, despite being the first to identify this variant and alert the world to it, the response from much of the world was uh, travel bans. Why do you think that happened? This happened because of uh, national innovation systems excellence by South Africa, based on the knowledge that South Africa built during the HIV AIDS pandemic, and therefore the ability of tracking, uh, of developing a support mechanism, research and development around pandemics. Um, and ability to share that information has been uh, shown to be South Africa's fault, um, that it's able to show the world how capable we are and how we can, we're prepared also to share the knowledge because we believe in global solidarity so that 
all the information that we've gathered can share and the world can learn how to come with a preventative measure. So South Africa is being punished for its research excellence. But do these kind of knee-jerk reactions just expose the lack of, of global clarity on this, the lack of a coordinated response? Absolutely. It also indicates the extent to which uh, global leadership has weakened over many, many years of neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalism globally uh, and a push towards globalization where over the, since the 1970s, we've seen the erosion of capabilities of many states and a reliance of them on the market. And in that process, eroded political leadership in preference for the market. And when pandemics and crises arise, such as the global financial crisis that we saw in 2008, and now recently the, the global health pandemic, that global leaders are unable to come with concerted effort that only not address their own needs as nation states, but also address global human challenges because we're all one, we're all humans. Therefore, we need that global solidarity, a co co cooperation, collaboration, and sharing of vaccines so that uh, all of us uh, come out together healthy as human beings within the world earth. And what do you think the impact of these travel bans is going to be on South Africa's economy the longer they're in place? Catastrophic. Uh, South Africa already not only has it got uh, high levels of infection um, of Omicron, but also high levels of unemployment at about 34.9 percent, a declining economy which shrunk by 1.5 percent in the third quarter of 2021. But more importantly, where it needs to create jobs, the tourism sector, uh, because of South Africa's beautiful flora and fauna uh, of really well-class facilities that is being punished because it is now summer in South Africa and we usually get quite a lot of American, European, uh, Middle East and Asian uh, visitors to our country. And therefore, we are not going to be able to address the problems I've highlighted if the ban continues. And we call upon the world to really think deeply and avoid this new reaction and open up the skies so that we can, as we address the pandemic, we also allow people to get jobs and improve their livelihoods. And that's why there's been this talk of, of a global pandemic uh, treaty. W what do you think of that but, idea? Is this, first of all, is it something that could work and, and is it going to materialize? It's something that could work. Remember that after the First World War, we worked together uh, and really pushed for the formation of what today we call central banks. Following the Second World War also, we worked together as the world uh, in the reconstruction and development of world economies by forming the, the, the two institutions of federal roads, the World Bank and the IMF. Even with the collapse of the gold standard, we came with mechanism of supporting one another. So we've got a history of global solidarity, particularly after uh, catastrophic events. And uh, COVID has been catastrophic. And as I've argued that, you know, uh, the treaty will go a long way again uh, to reignite and forge uh, humanity together, as we have done so historically, as I've indicated. And therefore, we feel in South Africa and many of our African brothers and sisters that were being let down again by, the, by particularly Europe and America in really taking a center stage as they did together with South Africa in these uh, episodes I've mentioned, the first, the second world war and the collapse of the gold standard. So it is that edge, that, we, that agency that we need from the global um, leadership to come to the table, to sign the treaty so that we can be able to share the knowledge distribute vaccine to highly integrated poor countries and really continue uh, to get our economies going as we, uh, as we work together to make sure that there is no human being left behind uh, in a world that is full of pandemics as well as global inequality. Uh, this global pandemic treaty aims to provide money for things like healthcare systems, personal protective equipment, research 
um, and, and pandemic preparedness. But all this is going to cost money. So who do you think should pay for it? Yes. So we have got multinational institutions that I've talked about, particularly the bread and Woods institutions. They need to come to the party, particularly supporting the highly indebted poor countries who have got no resources whatsoever in the areas of supplying vaccines as well as personal protective equipment. The rest of uh, lower middle income and upper middle income countries can also access loans, uh, which are very soft, which in fact the World Bank and IMF had announced around supporting these countries. So I think a lot of this effort we can pay ourselves out of it, but we require that global cooperation through a treaty because most of our countries don't have research capabilities and therefore they'll require support to fund deeper research, collection of data, and therefore in doing so mitigate any uh, potential um, uh, mutilation as well as um, other, uh, other pandemics cropping up. So really it's a mixture uh, of global solidarity funding it, a uh, mixture of us who can are capable and are able financially to fund ourselves, and a really global support for the highly indebted and poor countries who've got no resources to ensure that they get free access uh, to all the support mechanism, including the creation of capabilities for research um, and knowledge development. And the scientists have pointed out that um, until the whole world is vaccinated. This is just going to keep happening. We're still going to get uh, new variants uh, coming through, which will keep slowing down our efforts to get out of this pandemic. Do you think the Omicron variant is the wake-up call? And do you think the rich countries will stop hoarding vaccines now? Well, it is a wake-up call for all of us as humanity. And I think because of weak leadership in many of the uh, global North countries, there is a tendency of protecting um, their firms. What I've argued earlier that since 1970s, with neoliberalism, uh, many governments gave a lot of power to, to markets and, and entrepreneurship and, and companies, in this case, uh, big pharmacies. So if they continue protecting and giving power uh, to those uh, companies, we're unlikely to deal decisively with this pandemic. Therefore, we call upon the European and American leadership to rise to the challenge and work together with the farmers there, but with our own pharmaceuticals in the global south and share knowledge, share the vaccine and give free vaccine to poor, highly internal countries. And in doing that, uh, working together as one, we'll be able to overcome this pandemic. But at the same time, we'll open up our economies and ensure that uh, we create opportunities because we're facing huge challenges outside the pandemic. We have our, our climate and the unsustainability of the world health if we continue with the pandemic and also not coming up, working together on dealing with climate change, which is also gonna bring its own challenges such as food shortages and therefore have famine and poverty in many of the world. Um, and countries. Dr. Lumkile Monde, thanks for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, the new arms race is all about speed. Hypersonic missiles not only fly many times faster than the speed of sound, they are highly maneuverable, can carry nuclear warheads, and are hard to detect. Several countries are now spending billions to develop them. They include France, India, Japan, Australia, and North Korea. But China, the US, and Russia are running the most advanced programs. Now, Moscow recently fired its Sircon hypersonic missile from a warship and says it is part of a new generation of unrivaled armed systems. But it is China's advancements that are worrying the United States the most. Washington says Beijing has fired a projectile from the system during a test carried out in July. That signals the Chinese program has outpaced other countries. China denies it carried out the test. The U.S. is developing its own hypersonic weapons. While the Pentagon has been pushing for it, the Army is not expected to field its first missile before 2023. Washington has awarded contracts to major defense companies to develop a new hypersonic glide phase interceptor. It says it will be able to destroy an incoming hypersonic missile. Now, the U.S. has increased funding for hypersonic weapons in recent years. The Pentagon's budget request for the weapon research 
is $3.8 billion next year, up from its $3.2 billion for 2021. Russia has made upgrading its nuclear arsenal a priority. Over the next two years, it plans to spend around $50 billion on defence. China is investing heavily in advanced weaponry and more than $209 billion was set aside for defence this year. But its military budget is thought to be much larger than the official figures due to buried costs. Well, I'm joined here in Doha now by defence analyst Alex Gotopoulos to find out what's the big deal behind hypersonics. Thanks for being with us, Alex. So just tell us, what is the attraction of, of, of these hypersonic missiles right now? Why are so many countries investing in them? Well, hypersonic is a buzzword. It's, um, it, it's basically a measure of how fast that missile is going. So it's anything beyond five times the speed of sound. Or put another way, it's uh, 6,200 kilometres. So very fast. But normal missiles already travel this speed, normal ballistic missiles. A hypersonic missile is designed to leave the Earth, leave the atmosphere, and then plunge straight back in. What it can do is evade missile defences uh, that have been developed to stop traditional ballistic missiles. And that makes it dangerous in the sense that it can't be stopped. And you, you won't know until the last minute what the target actually is. So it's unpredictable, in essence. Speaking of unpredictability, um, because it's it's something so new right now in in the arms in the arms world, there isn't an agreement uh, between the U.S. and China, and there's also the expiry of most of the the old Cold War ac accords between the U.S. and Russia. So that makes it kind of a a free for all right now, doesn't it? It does, and that free for all was on the cards. Um, the United States has pulled out some of those um, big Cold War agreements. Uh, Russia, in turn, has also started to ignore them. China was never a signatory, so it's not bound by any of these agreements, and it has been developing its technology, military technology, at full pace. Uh, now it's the other countries that are starting to catch up, now that they're not pinned down by these old agreements that, frankly, never really anticipated these new technologies coming up, and they're, they're out of date, frankly. And wh why is the US lagging behind China on this? Well, the, the focus has been on counterinsurgency and those are rather thorny problems for the last decade and a half. The United States has been embroiled in at least two wars uh, and also the very costly um, process of potentially nation building. Uh, so the money hasn't been there. Uh, and then you've had a, an economic crisis, which has obviously um, had an impact on what can be developed. But now, now that those wars have finished, now those wars are over, and now that China has taken uh, a jump ahead in capabilities, America is now also catching up. And by the way, they have been developing this stuff quietly for about at least a decade with some degree of success. So do you, do you expect the US to start investing more in this technology now, knowing that uh, China seems to be racing ahead on this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think most countries will. Uh, France is also investing, by the way. Uh, India is developing a hypersonic missile, hypersonic version of its BrahMos missile. Uh, so all modern militaries will be looking to, to start to get this capability and to incorporate it into their arsenals and military thinking. And do these weapons have the potential to actually change the balance of power at all? At the moment, uh, hypersonic is a buzzword. It sounds great, it sounds futuristic, but these technologies have been around for decades. It's how you use these new missiles that's really going to see, determine whether they're actually got any more use on the battlefield or not. They're fast, they're unpredictable, and that's always a good thing if, when you are trying to destroy your enemy. And how lucrative is this going to be potentially for defence contractors? I mean, how beneficial is this going to be from a, a business point of view? I think certainly for the United States point of view, um, budgetary bodies are already worried about massive cost overruns. We had the stealth uh, F-35 programme go way, way, way over budget. And I think, um, I think now um, each of the three services are worried that they're going to be dragged into some sort of... Uh, commitment where you start to pay for something and then a decade down the line, it's costing three times as much. All right, Alex Kotopoulos, thank you. Now, German Sono Motors is one of a handful of startups that have developed a solar-powered vehicle. Its passenger Scion car is wrapped by solar panels that can automatically charge itself when it's sunny. 
It sounds environmentally friendly, though it's not quite fully solar powered. The car still has a battery, but it doesn't rely on being plugged in. The compact five door hatchback will be sold for 28,700 US dollars and is expected to make it to consumers by the first half of 2023. While the car can be charged through a wall box, Sono says the sun, which feeds energy into the battery, can handle most of the daily commute. So from Munich via Zoom, I'm joined now by Lauren Hahn, the co-founder and chief executive of Sono Motors. Thanks very much for being with us. So obviously you're heavily invested in this and you believe that solar powered cars are the future. Tell us why. We, we, we see that combustion engines are a thing of the past, electric vehicles are the present and solar electric vehicles we believe are the future. Why? Well, because they, do one thing, convenience. Convenience for our customers. Up to four times more range compared to any other electric vehicle with the same battery size. And that's convenience. That's why we integrate solar onto vehicles. But critics have pointed out the limits of this technology at the moment. Um, the fact that uh, no solar panel, they say, can generate enough power to drive the car around while still being small enough to be carried by the vehicle itself. What do you say to that? Look, our solar technology means that we charge this vehicle uh, with 5,800 kilometers on average per year. The driving distance is on average 12,000 kilometers a year in Europe. So what you have is already half of the distance you drive on average in Europe is today covered by solar. And now think about solar technology improving in efficiency over the next years. We will have cars on the road which cover your daily distance. And that's why we integrate solar on every vehicle. What's your primary market right now? Where do you see uh, demand at the moment mainly coming from for these cars? Look, we have two pillars where we build up our business on. First, the SEV, the solar electric vehicle, where we have 16,000 down payments worth over 400 million US in revenue. On the second pillar, we license and sell our solar technology to B2B customers, trucks, trains, camper van, buses, whatever moves, we can integrate solar. And all of that we make possible because our mission is put solar on every vehicle. And you say uh, solar powered cars makes electric vehicles more affordable. Your car is being sold, um, as we mentioned earlier, at uh, just under $29,000. How do you manage to keep it at that level? Well, there are five strategies we have which make this car so affordable. First, we have only one product. Second, we have no own factory. We let a contract manufacturer produce. Third, no paint shop because of solar. Fourth, uh, online direct sales. And lastly, only um, solar panels means you have no press stamping steel tools for the outer skin. And that five strategies allow us to be so affordable with our first vehicle. A lot of people who perhaps are not familiar with this technology and they hear they hear the word solar powered cars they'll they'll be inclined to think well this this can only really work in in warm countries or in, in places where the sun is is out all the time and in northern countries where it's cloudy and so on what's going to happen then i'm not going to be able to get power in my car what do i do then what do you say to that our numbers and figures we have on our website are in munich and i can tell you munich is not the sunniest place and even here makes sense totally sense but if you go more south, especially in region with a lot of sun, this car is perfect. This car is perfect for commuters. This car is perfect for taxi drivers, for delivery services, for uh, communities. This car is being shared. It's uh, having bidirectional charging. It has in solar panels integrated and being very affordable. So with that, we see great potential for other regions in the world. Good to have you on, Lauren Hahn. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Bye. 
And that is our show for this week. Get in touch with us by tweeting me at HazimSeeker and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Hazem Seeker from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.